great to meet everyone virtually. Um, and so I'm also gonna um, get straight into, you know, what we do in my lab, starting with a very broad overview. Um, so we are interested in this general question of how a cell is organized in space and in time. As you know, cells are not just bags of nucleic acids and proteins, but in fact, they are highly compartmentalized. And this compartmentalization is crucial for ensuring that biochemical reactions happen at the right place and at the right time. And we are interested in visualizing um, spatial organization and compartmentalization within the cell and understanding its functional significance. And we are um, addressing this question in the context of two main biological problems. First, we're interested in understanding how a cell cytoplasm is organized, and in particular, how um, crucial organelles like um, mitochondria um, are transported from one location to another um, in the cell and spatially positioned at the right place and at the right time. And in particular, the role of the microtubule cytoskeleton and motor proteins in mediating that transport and spatial positioning and how those processes may go wrong uh, in diseases. Um, we are also interested in nuclear organization, in particular the organization of the genome within the nucleus and how that regulates gene activity. Um, and as we work on these topics, we often realize that existing methods have limitations, so we also develop new methods to overcome those limitations and help us study the biology that we're interested in. And because I don't have too much time today, what I'm gonna try to do is take you through sort of one representative example of um, uh, the type of work that we do in the lab using um, nuclear organization, uh, genome organization as an example. Um, so I'm gonna start by um, showing you um, a movie um, to uh, sort of introduce uh, the problem of genome organization. Um, so, um, uh, DNA contains all the genetic information and um, human DNA uh, in particular is two meters long. So it's a very large biomolecule. And that two meter long DNA has to fit inside the space of a nucleus, which is only 10 to 20 microns in diameter. And so as you can imagine, um, um, the, the, the nucleus is 100,000 times smaller than the length of the DNA. So for the DNA to fit inside the nucleus, this requires an enormous amount of compaction. And DNA does not like to compact by itself. It's negatively charged, um, and those negative charges are repulsive. And so they need to be neutralized. And this happens uh, with the help of proteins. Um, so DNA complexed with proteins um, is called the chromatin. Um, and so I'm going to show you here a, a movie, uh, an animation um, that um, will um, show you the, our sort of textbook model understanding of how uh, this DNA protein complex, this chromatin is formed and organized inside a nucleus. Um, so here you see first just the naked DNA by itself. Um, just sort of jiggling around in space. And you will see at some point proteins coming in and landing on the DNA. These are histone proteins um, and uh, there are eight of them. Um, so it's an octamer of histone proteins um, that assembles together and the DNA uh, makes uh, turns, uh, two turns around the um, um, histones to form what is known as the nucleosome. A nucleosome is the repeating unit of chromatin. So you have this beads on a string-like organization um, that then um, with the help of multiple um, nucleosomes coming together, compacts further into a larger structure known as the 30 nanometer fiber. And then that 30 nanometer fiber further folds um, into larger structures. Um, and so um, if you watch this animation, you may get the impression that we already understand and know everything that needs to be known about how chromatin is formed and DNA is compacted um, and organized inside the nucleus. But in fact, um, this is not a real movie, it's an animation. And there is no microscope on earth that can actually generate um, a molecular detailed movie like this one. And I'm going to sort of spend quite a lot of time telling you about limitations of microscopy and how uh, we have um, uh, overcome them in the last decade. Um, and so um, how do we know <laughs> this is what's going on? Um, what we do is we piece together um, information from uh, different types of experiments. 
And one of the uh, sort of main experiments that led to this textbook model of how um, DNA is compacted inside the nucleus, oops, sorry, um, comes from in vitro reconstituted chromatin fibers. So basically this is just taking a piece of DNA and mixing it in a test tube with histones and looking at what is uh, formed uh, under an electron microscope. So you see here electron micrographs on the top, you see this beautiful beads on a string like organization of um, nucleosomes um, sort of interspersed with uh, naked DNA. Um, and so that's sort of like the first level of compaction. And then under certain conditions by uh, addition of salts, as well as additional histone proteins uh, that act as linkers, um, this um, 10 nanometer fiber can be further folded into a larger structure. Um, and that's the 30 nanometer fiber that you have seen in that animation. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, these are um, really nice structures, um, but again, this is not in the context of a nucleus. Um, these are in vitro reconstituted fibers. Um, so what does this actually look like in a nucleus? So we can uh, take the same approach. We can use electron microscopy and um, try to visualize um, inside a nucleus what chromatin looks like. And here I'm showing you an example again of an electron micrograph of a nucleus. Um, and here, uh, basically what you see are these dark regions um, um, and uh, the lighter regions. Um, and again, uh, this type of electron micrographs led to the conclusion that chromatin is organized in two compartments, a heterochromatin compartment, um, that is these dark regions that are compact and also uh, silenced, um, and a euchromatin region uh, composed of these lighter regions that are more open um, and also transcriptionally active. Um, but what does the actual sort of folding of the chromatin fiber look like uh, within these heterochromatin and euchromatin regions is something we can't really address um, using electron microscopy because of the lack of contrast in electron microscopy. So basically when we take an electron micrograph of a nucleus, uh, what we're visualizing is not just chromatin. Um, so chromatin is the main component, but there's a lot of other proteins there, as well as other nucleic acids like RNA, and, and we see everything. And this reduces contrast. And we can't really tell in detail how the, uh, specifically chromatin itself is folded. Um, and so, um, you know, this has sort of really limited our ability to visualize what chromatin looks like inside an intact nucleus. Um, at these um, length scales that are very relevant for gene activity. So, um, you know, compact fibers uh, like the 30 nanometer fiber um, reduce accessibility of the DNA uh, to regulatory proteins and polymerases. So it would be really important to know, uh, you know, in an intact nucleus, what um, those structures look like. Um, so how do we overcome this problem and introduce contrast? So one way to do that is to use light microscopy. Um, in light microscopy, we um, use labels, fluorescent labels, um, that we can attach to whatever protein we want. So for example, we can attach them to the histone proteins to light up the nucleosomes. And in this case, uh, we will only visualize nucleosomes in our um, light microscope image because everything else is unlabeled and is uh, not fluorescent. Um, so it doesn't generate any um, um, sort of uh, signal in our image. And so what do we see when we do that? So here um, I'm showing you again an image of a nucleus. Um, and I'm going to zoom up to this image so you see it more clearly. Um, and, uh, you can hopefully appreciate that um, in a light microscope image like this one, um, everything looks kind of homogeneous and blurry. So we don't really see anything that resembles a 10 nanometer fiber or a 30 nanometer fiber. And the reason for that is because light has low spatial resolution. Um, so we know light is a wave, it has a certain wavelength. Uh, visible light, for example, has wavelength between four to 800 nanometers. And we can't really visualize things that are smaller than roughly half the size of the wavelength. So you can think of this as uh, sort of painting a picture with a brush. In this case, uh, the brush is the light. Um, and you, you, that brush has a certain size. 
and you can't paint details into your picture that are smaller than the size of your brush. And so in this case, uh, we cannot visualize things that are roughly smaller than two to 300 nanometers. And the structures that we're interested in are much smaller than those length scales. Um, so in the end, we end up getting these very blurry, homogeneous looking images. Um, and so let's again, take a closer look at where that comes from. Um, so as I mentioned, we use fluorescent labels when we do light microscopy. The labels themselves are not large. They're actually very small. They're molecular scale. Uh, here I'm showing you, for example, a like green fluorescent protein, a commonly used uh, fluorescent molecule for labeling. Now, when we make an image of that um, uh, fluorescent molecule, the image itself is much larger than the size of the molecule. It's spread into this blob that's um, roughly half the size of the wavelength. Um, and so when you have two of these fluorescent molecules, if they're very far apart from one another, um, you can discriminate them because you will see two blobs on your microscope. And so you can say, I have two fluorescent molecules. But when they get close to each other, um, those blobs merge and overlap. So you see just one blob. Um, and you can't really discriminate that there are two fluorescent molecules that are in close proximity. And this is where the limitation in spatial resolution comes from. And uh, you know, when we are again talking about chromatin, um, those nucleosomes within a 10 or 30 nanometer fiber are very close to each other. So we can't really um, sort of discriminate them uh, using light microscopy. Um, now, um, this has been a, a problem for a very long time, limiting the spatial resolution of a light microscope. But in the last decade or so, there has been a revolution in the field of light microscopy. And this resolution limit has been broken. And the Nobel Prize uh, was awarded in 2014 and the Breakthrough Prize in 2018 uh, to the developers of super resolution microscopy. So I'm gonna quickly take you through how we break this limit and then tell you about how we are applying it in my lab to visualize uh, chromatin inside intact nuclei. Um, so again, we return back to this picture I showed you earlier where the image of a fluorescent molecule is much larger than the molecule itself. But even though this um, is a big blob, what we can do is we can find the location of the molecule very precisely. The molecule is at the center of the blob. But we can only do this if we have one molecule that is isolated in space. Uh, when we have multiple molecules in close proximity, um, then we can't anymore discriminate, right? Um, so um, the trick in super resolution microscopy is to use molecules that are photo switchable, that can be switched between bright and dark states. So now imagine that there are actually two fluorescent molecules here that are in very close proximity, but one of them is dark, so it's not giving out light. And the other one is bright, so we only see the light coming from that molecule. Now imagine that I can switch the molecule off and then switch on the next one that is next to it. Now I have another blob that is slightly shifted and I can find its center position very precisely. Now I broke the diffraction limit, uh, the limit of spatial resolution, because I have discriminated two fluorescent molecules that were very close to each other. And I have reduced this uh, blob into two dots in space. And this is essentially how super resolution microscopy works. Here's an example using microtubules in the cell. Um, so this is what, again, a normal fluorescent image would look like. Um, and in the middle movie, you see what our data looks like. So you have these blobs switching on and off um, over time. And each blob is the image of an individual fluorescent molecule that we can localize and pinpoint its position in space. And over time, by uh, uh, localizing more of these uh, fluorescent molecules, we can reconstruct a pointillist image. It's like a pointillist painting of the underlying structure. So in my lab, we have been applying this to visualize genome organization, chromatin organization inside the nucleus. And again, we can um, you know, convert these blurry images into things that are much more detailed that now start to tell us information at the uh, 20 to 30 nanometer length scales that are uh, you know, the length scales that we really care about. 
And I will show you one snippet of what we can do by being able to visualize this. Um, um, and what we can do is we can look at how the genome folding changes in different cell types or in response to mechanical um, environments. Um, and um, um, so an example of um, how we have done this is to take cells, um, mesenchymal stem cells, and grow them on different substrates that have different stiffnesses. And this is relevant because cells in your body experience different, different um, uh, tissues, and those tissues have different stiffnesses. For example, bone can be as stiff as a glass, whereas brain tissue is much softer. And we know that cells adapt to their environment, and they can um, change their phenotype based on the environment. So we ask the question of whether those changes in cell phenotype in response to environment are embedded in the sort of folding on organization of the genome, which controls their gene activity. And so here are some uh, example super resolution images of uh, the genome of uh, these different um, cells growing on different substrates. And you can appreciate that the genome folding um, really adapts to the mechanical environment, to the stiffness of the environment, and looks very different on stiff versus soft um, tissues. And this is not only physiologically relevant, but it's also pathologically relevant. So we can take cells from healthy individuals or individuals um, suffering from tendonitis. This is a, a disease in which um, the um, tendon changes its mechanical properties. And the tendon cells that are residing within that tissue are now experiencing a new environment. And again, we can differentiate a healthy cell from a diseased cell based on uh, the genome folding and the genome organization. And what is more, we can take a healthy cell and grow it on different environments, different substrates, and make it look um, like a healthy cell um, or a diseased cell. So really, the um, mechanical environment um, impacts the genome folding and then the phenotype of these cells. So I'm going to stop there and um, just acknowledge my group um, and my collaborators, um, a lot of them here at Penn um, that work with us on understanding how a genome is folded and how that is regulated um, by different um, cues. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you may have.